I too would like to welcome all of you here. Um, and I can't say how much I've been looking forward to this discussion. So this is, um, this is a real pleasure for me and it's a thrill. Uh, if Phil has been talking about how to assess BIM's role in academia via an evaluation of its impact on practice, which we could say is really the topic of the morning session, um, I'll offer some introductory remarks on how to assess BIM's pedagogical placement in the architectural curriculum, which is, in essence, the themes of the afternoon. To a certain extent, um, this can't be separated, um, the discussion ab about um, curricular issues can't be separated from the earlier issue of evaluating first what the relationship is between um, BIM to the profession and then how academia will adjust. But, um, but if, we're sus if we suspend that practice academia connection for a moment and concentrate within the realm of curricular academic context for a moment, um, one can be speculative um, about, um, about what that placement is and, and how we can um, maybe uh, set a context for that, for that discussion. I have to say the speculative nature of, of my remarks are certainly aided by the fact that I do not know the software at all. Um, and hence my thoughts in some way could be seen as pure. Um, academically pure, um, or else they might be thought of as deeply naive, but <laughs> those might actually go together and have some um, productive difference around them. Um, but as the chair of the curriculum committee uh, here at, at Yale, answering the question of, um, of how we actually train designers of the future um, is my job and my primary interest. Um, I want to first describe what I think is the common scenario for architectural education here in the U.S. to indicate um, the tensions that I think um, are uh, uh, brought to the fore when BIM enters into the equation. And I have to say, in some way, I understand that this scenario that I'm describing might be particular to Yale. Um, but in some way, Yale is a pure condition because we do not have an engineering school. Um, we do not have a landscape school. We do not have a preservation school. We do not have those outlaying disciplines to which um, a BIM education might uh, look to in an interdisciplinary, you know. So, so in some way, Yale as a, is architecture and BIM in architecture has to be um, identified in a, in a singular fashion. So that's, that's how I'll describe it, but it's, a, it's an important test case maybe. Um, in most MARC or even BR curricula um, that have 18 points uh, per credit per semester, usually nine points, which is to say half of the credits um, go to studio, and the other half are distributed over a number of different disciplines, um, structures, structures is related to systems integration, history theory, environmentalism, fabrication, professional practice. So all those others get, get the other half. Um, uh, and besides this kind of hierarchical division that, pri that privileges studio via point distribution, there is as well the distinction between courses that are required, which is to say where the academy is saying it's essential, um, versus those that are electives, which we're saying are, are not essential but, but helpful. Um, below this, then, are courses that are not considered credit worthy. Um, because they're merely tools and in and of themselves don't convey knowledge. Um, and these, at least here at Yale, and I think it's true in other places, are given the designation workshops. Um, you don't get credit for them, but we understand that they um, help a, um, an architectural um, or an emerging architectural designer with their work. This is where technology goes. This is where the software goes. Um, sometimes, again, software can be put into credit courses, um, but only if we see that the knowledge um, that's conveyed transcends that software, which is to say, almost in spite of that software. Um, so, uh, so software and technological issues um, are seen as, in some way, I'm trying to put this as an aside to an aside to an aside, and, and one that we've um, struggled to figure out in, in an academic context. Enter BIM. Um, 
looks like software issue, which is to say it will either be offered in an on-credit workshop or tucked into another course um, that has other objectives. But if it's tucked into another course, um, where um, and in what discipline? Um, could be in the technology systems integration area, um, where it's linked to building construction information makes it an important tool. Um, or maybe it belongs to environmentalism, where the long held back information that we have consistently ignored now is being entertained, and it's being entertained at this particular moment could go hand in hand with us entertaining a new environment, a new tool that allows us to integrate it um, with our um, architectural knowledge. Um, or it could fit into fabrication courses, um, where, of course, it becomes a, um, a helpful tool in terms of moving from um, design to building and all the information about materials and procurement that come with it. Um, but um, I want to say that um, BIM, in each of these cases, is seen as an awkward intruder in courses that, um, again, being assigned only three credits, which is one third of what studio is, are already pressed in a pre-BIM model to convey knowledge um, that is significant, and more than that, prove its significance to students who are being told by the point distribution that it's secondary, if not tertiary, information. Um, so BIM then intrudes on disciplines that are already hard pressed to convey their knowledge um, and are, are trying to survive um, at, um, uh, in, in a marginalized context and worry about the further marginalization as they have the bonus of teaching um, software that puts aside the, the already complex information that they want to teach. Or does it go into professional practice? Um, this has the advantage of making the statement that BIM is not just a software tool, but rather an organizational method by which the profession is practiced. But it also has the disadvantage for BIM of making, it clear, making a clear statement that BIM is part of the student's future postgraduate education and that its existence in the curriculum, in the professional practice course, in the present, is a sampling only. It tells you the terms by which you can then, will be able to be conversant when you get into professional practice, but it really says that professional practice is where you're going to learn this. Or BIM could be neither a software nor a professional organizational method, but rather a new way of practicing design, which means that it might legitimately be placed and taught in the studio. But if in the studio, where? The advanced studios, where students already sophisticated with design fundamentals can take on the new modes of design deployment provided by BIM, seems like an obvious answer. But when one considers the fact that most schools, in most schools, advanced studios are basically electives, with no guarantee that anyone will either be able to offer a BIM studio or the students will choose to take it, it basically functions like an elective that says we neither require it um, um, nor think that it's necessary. Um, so then if you put BIM in the core studios where it can be tackled head on, early on, and by everyone, um, which makes some sense given the scenario that I've been describing, um, and surely as a form of, uh, of practicing design, this makes perfect sense. But here again, obstacles arise. Not only are there so many pre-BIM design fundamentals that need to be covered, form, compositional, spatial hierarchy, planning, programming, the social implications of that social play programming, that BIM becomes an overload. And I would say more fundamentally, the intimacy of the design process is deeply shaken by a software whose main attribute is precisely to do away with that intimacy. An intimacy that is threatened by no longer believing in the singular author and no longer believes in the myth of inspiration. In laying this out, I want to convey two things. One, that BIM threatens all of the hierarchies that we have established in academia, whether between the divisions that we have between the disciplines or between the primacy of a studio and the secondary nature of the other courses, or between what we do and do not consider to be fundamental in the form of what we call to be required or elective courses. And two, 
that it is not merely a case of determining whether you think of BIM as a software tool, as a professional organizational method, or as a form of design practice. Rather, any and all of these designations find a curriculum that is unreceptive to, nay, threatened by BIM. I can see three conceptual categories of solution. One, we don't really change anything that we are doing now, which is to say we sprinkle BIM education in different, mostly elective or workshop contexts, and thereby claim either that A, it is the professions, not the academy's responsibility for educating its employees and footing the bill for that education, or B, that we are suspending judgment and curricular adjustment until we know more about what will and will not emerge professionally. Or two, in academia, we, we in academia see that it is our responsibility to offer this education, but as an add-on, making it an advanced degree program that students can enter into after they receive their unbimmed professional degree. In this, we are admitting that A, students already stretched economically would need to fork out even more money, and B, that this is not essential to a professional degree, but an option for those who want to specialize. And then three, the third conceptual category, that we, that we restructure our MARC or B, our curriculum to accommodate something that is identified as necessary for the first professional degree student, adjust the curriculum accordingly, and acknowledge that the tuition paid by the students for a professional degree will cover what they need to function in that profession. If we do the latter, I believe it will be necessary to reconsider the hierarchies that I have described let me suggest two obvious adjustments. One, that BIM does enter studio education at a pre-advanced studio level, which would be a rethinking of precisely the intimacy with which we have always approached this act. I can go on and on about why I think personally that this intimacy needs to be cha challenged, and that's a large part of what building in the future was about. Um, but I also want to say that if, if I feel that that needs to be challenged, it sits right beside my, my commitment to design and the fact that I think design education or our ability to produce students who put objects out in the world that are beautiful and not just smart is absolutely essential. We might, um, yeah, um, here we would promote design expertise while jettisoning the preciousness of the design act. A second model would be that we restructure an education that currently puts studio at its apex and instead lets design reside equally in other areas of the curriculum, one or more of which would include and teach BIM. That is, we both de-silo design singular home and demythologize the studio as design anointer. If BIM is taken seriously in academia, which is to say that it is both required and design focused, one that teaches collaboration as a technique and introduces knowledge that is not foreign to design but integral to it, economic, environmental, constructional, BIM and the academy will need to emphasize, I think, not its efficiency but its exploration of the unknown not its effect on the marketability of its graduates, but its effect on their willingness to embrace the marketplace as a form of their education. The tension between practice and the academy should not in any way go away. Rather, the academy should embrace its traditional role as a challenge to the profession, to lead it, not follow it. If many of us here believe that BIM is an opportunity for architecture to recapture its rightful place in the building industry, some of us also think that the academy should seize it as an opportunity to reclaim its rightful place as the leaders of the education of the, of the designer. Let me just leave you with a speculative model that interests me for a three-year MR program. A first year that concentrates on 2D, which is to say composition, or the manner in which architectural visualization fluctuates between 2D and 3D ambiguity, which is to say the images that we were putting up about the geometric analog do not go away. They're part of how we actually think through both visual design information and how, it, how we deal with the fact that we are not actually practicing on the building itself. That issue just does not go away. 
a second year that concentrates on 3D, which is to say emphasizes the spatial and tectonic dimensions of architecture, and a third year that emphasizes 4D, how the making of architecture exists in the temporal realm, where BIM becomes the design environment. In all of these years, history theory, structures, environmentalism, and fabrication would embrace the speculative as well as the practical thinking that accompanies each of these dimensional environments. Design is not sacrificed. It is rather spread into multiple dimensional contexts. 